Hello. Last week we started a series of studies by video on uh, the character of Nehemiah, and in particular the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, and we entitled that Let Us Rise Up and Build. We talked about how uh, Nehemiah was a great builder. His name's sort of synonymous with building and rebuilding and that kind of thing, and that maybe this was a timely thing to be thinking about as we get ready to rebuild things from this strange time in our lives. Um, there was a guy named John Scully the, the third, uh, who had a great job and a comfortable life. He was president of Pepsi Cola in the late uh, 70s, early 80s. Um, as you can imagine, very wealthy, pretty well known, very secure. He wasn't really looking for a career change or another job. So you can imagine his initial response when this unknown guy named Steve Jobs came trying to hire him to work alongside him in a fledgling company that no one had yet heard of called Apple. Steve Jobs, though, had a great vision. And he sensed Scully's reluctance to hop on board and leave behind Pepsi. And so he made this now famous sales pitch. He said, John, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? John decided to go and help change the world. And they did. Well, Nehemiah had a great job and, we imagine, a comfortable life. He was cupbearer to the king of Persia in the 5th century BC, chapter 1, verse 11 of Nehemiah. Now, the 5th century BC is about 500 years before Jesus was born. And when we hear the term cupbearer, if you're a student of scripture, Sometimes we think of a cupbearer as being part of the kitchen staff uh, who, who tasted the wine that was offered the king, sort of like a human guinea pig to make sure it's safe. We've really found that to be a misnomer for this particular time period in history. A cupbearer was actually a high official with incredible power and influence in the kingdom something like a secretary of state or even a vice president. That's how powerful they were. Nehemiah uh, walks in the halls of power in Persia. And so he's rich, he is secure, and he is set for life. He's also a Jew, a uh, part of an exiled people. He's really a foreigner in Persia. His homeland lay in ruins. The capital city of his homeland, Jerusalem, is not really even a city anymore. Its walls are rubble. One day, Nehemiah got a report from a brother of his about how bad things were back home. And suddenly he was faced with a choice. Stay in Persia continue to grow his retirement fund, or go change the world. The reason that we're aware of Nehemiah's name and the reason there's a book named after him in the Word of God is that he decided to go change the world. By the way, uh, Nehemiah's name, it means the Lord has comforted you know, there's a difference between being comfortable and being comforted by the Lord. And it's a big difference. A really important difference. I want to make a controversial statement, perhaps. And that is that the God of heaven is not greatly concerned with you being comfortable or me being comfortable. God does not care if as a body of Christ, the church, we are comfortable. 
In fact, he seems to prefer that we are not. That is a word we probably need to hear right now, don't you think? How easy it is to get comfortable. How easy it is to find in your life that sweet spot, that, that easy course, even in the work of the church, and just sort of settle there, you know? How easy that is, how comfortable that can be. You know what that easy groove is called in actuality? A rut. A rut. And you know what a rut is? A rut is just a grave with both ends kicked out. So if you want to die spiritually, get in a rut. And church, if you want to dwindle and die, stay in a comfortable rut. God calls people out of ruts. Doesn't care about our comfort but he, he does love to comfort people. There's a difference. I remember an old saying about preachers um, that, that a good preacher spends his time afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. But really, that's what the good God does. A God will afflict the comfortable and he will comfort the afflicted. Uh, Nehemiah's name really bears witness to this truth. Remember, his name means the Lord has comforted. So, comfortable Nehemiah, living in the lap of luxury in the court of King Artaxerxes of Persia, the greatest nation on earth at the time, he gets a message that the people back in his hometown of Jerusalem are living in great affliction. That's chapter 1, verse 3 of Nehemiah. And one of the wonderful things we learn about this man, Nehemiah, is that news affects him. He may have been living in luxury, but when he heard how the people back home were in such distress, he suddenly was miserable. He was afflicted by the news of the affliction of his brethren. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 says this, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You see, a heart like that, God can do something with. Nehemiah cared. Uh, he had compassion. His heart was broken with the very things that broke the heart of God. And so Nehemiah prayed. He prayed to the king of the universe. He served the king of Persia, but he prayed to the king of the world. And uh, in the last session, we read his prayer. In chapter 2 of the book, Nehemiah, as he no doubt often did, found himself uh, in the presence of the king of Persia. More than a hundred days had passed since he first received the news from his brother about what was going on back home, and it's still affecting him. Even when he's in the presence of the king, he can't help it. He's been that affected. It's hard to hide even before Artaxerxes, Nehemiah seems stricken. So I want us to read a few verses in chapter 2, right at the beginning, and see what happens. It says there, In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing that you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, 
the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So you, you follow what happened there. The king had picked up on Nehemiah's sadness and, and he asked, what's up? He asked for the source of it. it. It's not clear why Nehemiah says he was then very much afraid. Maybe um, it wasn't good practice or a wise thing to do to be uh, to be sad in the presence of the king. Maybe the king, like a lot of leaders, always wanted to have a, a happy, positive uh, face put on everything. But on the other hand, maybe Nehemiah feared that, that what made him sad would offend the king. Uh, this issue of the broken down walls of Jerusalem had actually come up before the king once before. You have to go back to another book, the book of Ezra. Uh, in the order of the, the Old Testament, Ezra comes just before Nehemiah. And in that book, Ezra, in the fourth chapter, Artaxerxes, the king, had made a decree that the city not be rebuilt. So the king has already spoken on this issue, and now Nehemiah is bringing it up again? That may be why he's afraid. And so I think, again, we get some insight into the heart of this great man, Nehemiah, who may have been comfortable, but he didn't stay comfortable. And, and who had it easy, but he was willing to take on a difficult task. The title of this study, if you didn't see it on, on the header of the video, was, Who's Nehemiah anyway? And why should I care? That may be something people are asking when they see what we're talking about. Well, I hope at least what we've shared so far has helped answer that. But just a few other things before we finish. I want to just give you some raw data, uh, just for the record, about Nehemiah. Nehemiah came to Jerusalem in the year 445 B.C. The scripture is very specific uh, with dates in Nehemiah and in Ezra, and so we can be pretty specific in, in when it happened. He comes to Jerusalem, which we'll read about later, in 445 B.C. It's about 13 years after Ezra had first returned to the city. Uh, Nehemiah is mentioned eight times in the Bible. He's mentioned once in the book of Ezra and all the others in this book. That, that actually bears his name. Over a period of about 20 years, Nehemiah likely made several trips back and forth between the capital city of Persia, which was called Susa, and the capital of Israel, Jerusalem. Nehemiah, in addition to being cupbearer to the king of Persia, becomes a two-time governor of Jerusalem. And once he actually starts the project of rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem, it is completed in 52 days. I just think about that 52 days, less than two months. Uh, Nehemiah and his workers rebuilt the walls of that great city. But Nehemiah restored more than just walls. He also, in his career, restored regular temple worship and regular teaching from the Word of God, and he restored serious Sabbath-keeping, which was a main tenet of the Jewish faith, and he did a lot to build godly families among the people of Israel. Nehemiah was a builder in many, many ways and a restorer. But one of the wonderful things about this man was that he never took credit. Uh, he never patted himself on the back 
or took credit for himself. He always gave the credit to someone else. Um, he always gave it to God. One of the themes of Nehemiah's story is, is a phrase uh, that, that says, the hand of God. You can sort of trace that phrase in the book of Nehemiah. He says over and over, the hand of God was upon me or was upon us. So God gets the credit, you see. God receives the glory always. That's something that we must learn um, and something that we must follow if we would belong to God. The idea that to God be the glory, great things he has done. Nehemiah was also a, a true man of prayer, and we will learn more about that in the next uh, session of this study. Um, he loved his people, and, and obviously he loved his God, and he was a man of prayer. And so in this, what I think is a very important book of the Word of God, there is a lot to learn from and a lot to benefit from. Yes, to a degree, it's about building walls, physical walls of brick and mortar, but it's really more about building a people. It's about building a kingdom. And we can understand it in terms of building the kingdom of God and, and building uh, the work of God in us. Um, there are some verses in the New Testament maybe you're familiar with that actually reflect on the, the Old Testament. Um, there's, a, there's a text that says, for, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That's found in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. There's another passage that says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. And when those things are said, it's, it's stories like that of Nehemiah that are being referred to. You know, the book is there for our learning and our encouragement. Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he said, Timothy, from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, writings like Nehemiah. And then he says, these are, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So I hope we realize as we open up uh, Nehemiah together, this isn't an academic exercise. That's not why I'm taking time to do this. This is really a faith exercise. So we're not so much talking about physical things here, but spiritual. Um, we don't study Nehemiah, although I'm sure you could learn things about this in Nehemiah, but we don't study Nehemiah so we can learn how to succeed or we can learn how to make money in this world. Uh, but we learn things of the Spirit. We, we learn how to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and how to help others come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Because we, we realize that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All Scripture is profitable for that. So I would encourage you to read this book if you're if you're following along in these videos to, to read this book, to pray about it, and uh, pray for your relationship with the Lord and, and for the church. Pray for our friends and neighbors um, that the hand of God will be upon us all and that it will indeed afflict us out of our comfortable complacency, if that's what we need, and that it will, that is the hand of God, comfort us in any genuine affliction that we may encounter. And may God be glorified as a result. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. 
So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may come in. May the Lord bless you today and build you up in the faith.